Wow, look at all these young faces. This is fabulous. I bet you didn't know there was as many exotic ways of speaking English, did you? Well, well, I'll tell you, one of the things you're going to get in this conference, because we have Ravi, who I usually have to translate, um, then we have um, Michael Ramsden, who's not here, but English, we have Tanya Walker, who will speak with a delightful English accent. We have Simon from the colonies here, joking, <laughs> with the Australian. And uh, of course, I'm actually uh, living in America. My son, who some of you will hear, uh, although born in Vienna, Austria, sounds, well, he sounds like American. His mum's American. Somehow the Scottish DNA didn't get in there, so he voted independence before today came around, so I don't know what happened. Anyway, it's great to uh, be with you, and we're thrilled. And, you know, I know that we have to put on a kind of thinking cap, health warning for some of this stuff. Uh, depending on your church tradition, some of you are used to more, you know, um, spiritual and, and lively and engaging type stuff, and that's fine. We're not against any of that. We believe you love the Lord your God with your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. But it does say your mind as well, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. So sometimes we have to put on our thinking caps. And we have to do a bit of hard work because our gospel goes into a public square that is a challenging world where a big, big number of the people don't believe what you believe and have no intention of believing what you believe. And so you have to defend it, you have to witness to it, and hopefully you have to believe it yourself. And that counts. First, let me begin by giving you a little background uh, just about my own story. I was not raised in a Christian home. I was raised in, uh, my father was the product of the Second World War. He was real, really what in British terms we call a Fabian socialist. So the post-war generation were very out about the liberal society, the egalitarian world. And I was raised a lot with getting Darwin thrown down my throat and little quotes from Nietzsche and all this kind of thing. And I was an angry young man. A lot of Scots are like that, by the way. They're fit with some of the Australians. So I liked, I learned very quickly early on in school. I never liked bullies. I had this thing's about bullies. That's spelled B-O-O-L-I-E-S in Scottish. Bullies. Um, I never liked bullies. And so I was a fighter. And I would fight a lot and get into trouble. And I didn't pick fights on the little people. I always liked to fight the big guys who picked on the little people. That was the ones that I wanted to go after. That was the Batman. No. Um, but through that, I got into trouble with my father because my father and I went head to head. And basically, when I was 15 years of age, I ended up in a serious fight with my father because I was drinking and I left home when I was 15 and I was out on my own. And then life was wonderful, you know, young guy living on his own. Well, it wasn't wonderful because I had to buy my own food. I had to wash my own clothes. I didn't know that part of existence was there because you had a mom, right? That's mom's job, and mom does all. It just happens automatically. You just assume it's part of existence. You don't think somebody actually like, do it yourself kind of stuff. I get into a world then of which I began to learn how to use my hands and um, became working. I, I get interested. Well, this, well, this fits very well with Hong Kong. Bruce Lee was the, the cult of the time, you know, Fists of Fury. And so I get into martial arts. I know it looks strange, but I get into martial arts at that time. And, you know, it was funny. I remember being downtown Glasgow one night, and I was training, and actually I was doing karate, not at, uh, Wing Chun or any of those things at the time. And uh, a fight broke out in the street, and everybody's going, wah, wah, wah. you know, they're all becoming sort of little Bruce Lee copies, and it was a joke because half of them had no idea. But the long and short was I went into a world in which I ended up working in a dance hall. I was a bouncer and uh, began to make money that way, wanted to hurt people. Had no thoughts about God, religion, or spirituality. It was never on the equation. It wasn't in my thought. My grandmother was a Christian, but I thought Christianity was past its sell-by day. I thought it was intellectually moronic. I, did, I just thought it was idiotic. Why would you even be a Christian? Who would consider such a thing? It was revolting. Then this one day, this uh, woman I was living with, she was a married woman. She was seven years older than me, so I thought it was pretty cool. Young guy, you know, babe, woman who's crate and, you know, driving E-type Jaguars and all the... Things were going. I was on the upwardly mobile. One day she walks in, what do you think about Jesus? <laughs> Who? <laughs> Nothing. I never thought about Jesus in my life. Why would I think about Jesus? But it led to God breaking into my life. And some of the things that Simon said that I never ever thought about. I remember going to a house in which my plan was to beat the Christians up. And I get ambushed by God. And by the way, he's bigger than me. And I didn't have arguments, and I had an encounter. I mean, I threw out all kinds of stupid comments. They witnessed to the glory of God in the face of Christ, and I got converted. And all I knew was that after this encounter in Bailiston in Glasgow in Scotland, 
I was a new creation. I didn't have an argument. I went in where I was working with these Glasgow thugs, and I'm talking to them the next day, and all I can say is, I know Jesus, and I did. But what did I know? I didn't know anything I could explain. I couldn't give evidence for Scripture or the problem of evil. Or you, you know, I had nothing except God had me, and it was real. So that's my background, because I went off bright-eyed and bushy-tailed into mission. I got involved with this group called Operation Mobilization, went to help the church in Eastern Europe. My first summer, uh, my first experience, I got thrown in jail uh, for 40 days, and I thought, that's great, God. All the time I'm staying on the other side, I keep out of jail, I join your team, and I get locked up. What's wrong with this picture? But in the interrogations by these communist authorities, as they would engage, I realized they kept asking questions. Who sent you? Did I work for the CIA, MI5? I said, no, no, my father sent me. Oh, good. What does your father do? Well, he runs the universe. Oh, no, we're not meaning that. You know? <laughs> now, those were kind of a trite answers, and over time I had to learn to give better ones. But it was a truth, wasn't it? God did run the universe. But as I went out into evangelism, and I was living in Austria, that's where my children were born. And as I would work with French or Germans and I would share the gospel, I felt a little bit like the Americans found out when they landed in D-Day or the Brits with these Sherman tanks. And they came up against things like German tigers and king tigers. They had bigger guns, they had thicker armor, and it was like throwing tennis balls against them. Because although I believed in God and I believed in the Holy Spirit and I believed in Scripture, I didn't know how to engage with the people. It wasn't that it wasn't a question of truth. It was a lack of compelling power to engage with them. I didn't have the resources to engage. And I studied Scripture. I used to read, and I still do as much as I can, but I would read the Bible 20 chapters a day, every day. I did that for years. Soaked myself in the Bible. And that became part of my story. So this idea of fit bodies and fat minds, where does that come from? It's the title of a book by a colleague of ours, Oz Guinness. And of course, the idea today in physical fitness, everybody wants to have a fit body, but often leaves the mind to atrophy. You know, because you've got thinking and all that kind of stuff. Who wants to do that? In fact, even since I've been here, a couple of people know we're doing this, this, this conference and they begin to ask questions. Well, it's not all about intellectualism and we don't do theology and we don't do philosophy. And it's amazing how we want to qualify why Christians shouldn't be thinking. When in fact, that's what our Lord did. And the Jewish people from which we come are probably some of the most intellectual people on planet Earth. They have more PhDs. They have more Nobel Prizes because they think. Now, thinking isn't everything, but you can't live without thinking. Even while you're sitting here trying not to think, you're thinking about not thinking, right? You're thinking, what a weird big Scots guy that is. I don't know why I'm in here. I wish I was out there playing with my Xbox or something. But you're thinking. So it's inescapable. Many years ago, Elton Trueblood said this, a wise source of insight on the Christian life, said there are three areas that must be cultivated if any faith is to be a living faith. The inner life of devotion, the intellectual life of rational thought, and the outer life of human service. Three things. The inner life of devotion, the intellectual life of rational thought, and the outer life of human service. Now, most contemporary Christianity only focuses on two of those things. Usually, devotions and service. We think that's it. Just come to church and be in the choir or stand at the door or give out the food. And it's all about the church. Now, I'm for the church, but there's a life of the mind to engage us for the world. Most of our life is working or being in school or being outside of the walls of the building. So how do we engage with the public world? So my goal in this session is to talk about the role of the mind in Christian living Secondly, the importance of learning how to think as a Christian and act as a Christian, because that takes more than just automatic uh, pilot. And thirdly, the reason for ongoing discipline and some of the obstacles, personal and cultural, that work against the life of the mind. Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. The Apostle Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living and holy sac sacrifice, acceptable unto God. Then it says, therefore, be transformed by the removal of your mind so you can be an effective Christian. No, no, it doesn't say that, does it? Be transformed by the renewal of your mind that you may prove what the will of God, that, that is which is good and acceptable and perfect. So Christians have to be serious about the transformation of the mind, the thought life, the image life, all that goes on within. 
2 Corinthians chapter 10, 3 through 6, the apostle puts it this way. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We're destroying speculations, every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. We are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We're ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. So to have our minds, our thoughts, and our views shaped by the, by the world is one option, by culture, by society, by media, by Twitter, by Facebook, by Instagram, by all the apps on your iPhone, or to have it being shaped also, or in a more significant way, transformed by Scripture. So it doesn't happen automatically. It requires discipline. It requires choice. It demands vision, intention, and means. We have to put ourselves into this. Now, in the Corinthian passage in verse 5, Paul is talking about this idea of, he uses the image of a fortress, everything raised up against the lofty, against the knowledge of God. Fortresses are all over Europe. I grew up with castles. I lived in Austria for 20. I love fortresses, love castles, fantastic things. If you've been watching the Scottish referendum, every picture is of Edinburgh Castle. 13th century, I mean, wow, look at that marvelous thing. It was there, even when Scotland rebelled against the English historically, there was English garrisons in that castle, and it couldn't get broken into, it was so strong. Fortresses, where are the fortresses in modern culture? Fortresses like Hollywood, fortresses like some of our university, fortresses like public opinion shaped by media, that as Christians we are throwing our tennis balls and they're bouncing off. There are not very few Christians in there, or Christians are ignoring it, or if we do it, we do it in an ineffective way. So ladies and gentlemen, it's time for us to think, and think more seriously about reasoning and engaging. It's an essential component of the Christian life. So that, let me take you back then to what really, God, really loving God means. Matthew 22, 36 through 40, I think is one of the hinge passages of Scripture. It connects the Old Testament and the New Testament seamlessly. Jesus is asked a question by a lawyer. Lawyers like that. Lawyers like to probe and ask questions. And no offense to any of the lawyers in the room, but it is part of the lawyer trade, right? And so they want to know uh, what's the, the greatest commandment in the law. And Jesus says, which is really the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus qualifies. He puts the, the mind aspect is in there, the strength aspect. But then he says, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So loving God with your whole being is part of what it means to truly image God. If you neglect the mind, you are doing less than justice to your relationship with God. I look at you, bright young men and women, many of you, and you're studying, and I know your parents have all kinds of ambitions and wonderful plans for your life, but you've got to have your own wonderful plan that God has made you with, with dignity, with grace, and with unique talents. He wants you to be something special. Some of you will become computer scientists. Some of you will be actors. Some of you will be lawyers. Some of you will build things. Some of you maybe take things apart. Some of you might be soldiers, some of you might be sailors, pilots, all kinds of stuff. But you will do that by dedicating your mind and learning. And if you do it as a Christian to the glory of God, then you have something to witness to. The greatest mind on earth given to us in the Lord Jesus. Dallas Willard said this, We first turned away from God in our thoughts, so it is in our thought life that we must ignite the revolution of our character. Thoughts are where we can begin to truly change. In our thoughts dwell powerful ideas, images, and information. And these three things will become crucial in our, our pursuit of spiritual transformation. So how do we remove near the wine? How do we get this right? Where do we begin? Did I mention I used to be a bouncer in a, da in a dance hall? So I brought to my Christian life, when I became, I knew literally nothing, nothing. I had no Christian heritage, no Christian background. I mean, I basically was wise enough to know that beating people up wasn't a good idea, sort of, but I thought that was just a social convention. I didn't think it was actually, you know, morally wrong when I was doing it, although inside I, I probably did. But, you know, God's Word, I got converted in a very, very conservative Christian group. Um, not a part of that, that group, but they were, I mean, to say they were conservative, I mean, I didn't know anything. I thought they were the only church, and of course they told me they were. <laughs> so, I mean, I know what was a church anyway. I mean, I had all my music collection, and so I was told I shouldn't smoke, shouldn't drink, shouldn't go to the movies, shouldn't have blah, blah, blah. So I'm throwing out my records, getting rid of everything, and coming to these churches and sitting, and just, it was the Bible and prayer. It wasn't very much in the beginning, but you know, that's all there was. Um, 
But the scriptures began to penetrate my heart. And I tell you this, the role of God's word in obedience is key. In John chapter 8, 31 and 32, Jesus was saying to the Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Most of the time you hear that verse quoted, people quote the second part and ignore the first part. So you hear it in universities, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. They do not mean the truth according to God's word. They're thinking of truth independent of God's word. But this statement was made by the Lord Jesus. And you cannot separate verse 32 from verse 31, which is that if you continue in my words... In Psalm 119, verse 9 through 11, it says, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Just before that, it says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By keeping it according to thy word. That was a mantra in my life. Because I knew that everything that I had been formed by was wrong. I was living by my passions. If I wanted something, I took it. If someone crossed me, I hit them. If I wanted to indulge, I indulged. I was living by passion. My passions needed to come under the soul of my reason. My reason needed to be ruled by something higher, which was God's Word. And that began the process of renewing my mind. When I was arrested, I was put in prison four times. I was in prison in Czechoslovakia. I was in prison in Russia. I was in prison also in uh, Yugoslavia. But one of the things we happened, my friend who had been raised a Christian, one of the guys that was in prison with me, and he had been at Young Life and had done all this Bible memorization. So we got, we, they took our Bibles away, of course. We got a piece of, uh, we got a, a, a book, a little workbook. We started writing down every Bible verse we could remember so that in the morning we could have devotions. This guy had memorized, I couldn't, about hundreds hundreds of verses. So we had bits of Timothy and John's gospel. And I mean, I could remember quite a bit myself. And we would use that as our devotional life. Here we were in prison walking around with handwritten verses as best as we can remember. But the scripture was speaking to our soul. If your Bible, your iPad and all that gets taken away, if you're thrown in prison, what will hold you? Your emotions? Your worship songs, if you don't have them anymore? You don't have your iPad? You better get the word into your heart. In Proverbs chapter 2, it tells us what the Word does. And this is one of my favorite understandings of what Scripture does for us and why we should do this. In Proverbs, the pursuit of wisdom, it says 1 through 6, My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commandments within you, make your ear attentive to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding. If you cry for discernment, lift your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, that's, that's a conditional there. So how do people look for treasures fanatically? When you know there's something buried, whether it's Spanish bull, bullion or whatever it was, people that really believe it's there, they put a lot of time and effort to go look for it. Hidden treasure. That's how we're supposed to look for Scripture. It says, then you will discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom and from his mouth comes wisdom. So a great contemporary danger for many of us in the churches, and I'm an evangelical, I'm a card-carrying evangelical. I've been around the evangelical church, Pentecostals, Baptists, Lutherans, Presbyterians all my life. I love the evangelicals, but we are an odd bunch. We often claim to know more than we know. We're full of all kinds of arrogance about things sometimes. We love to assert the truth, not defend it. We think we're, we're tougher than we are. There's a lack of humility many times, and we need to learn to think carefully. And one of the things I've seen in many Christians' life is what a problem of what I would say is dualistic thinking. What do I mean? We have compartmentalization. So we talk, use words like sacred and secular, public and private, faith versus reason. These are spiritual walls that separate us from thinking healthily and holistically about all of life and all of real, real, uh, relationality. We have compartmentalization. Some of you go to church on a Sunday and you go to Monday and you're a different person. Same thing, you're in the youth group and you're Mr. Spiritual and you're Mr. Horrible when you're in Monday morning in the class, right? Or when you're on the Twitter feed. Your language, your, your ethics, your morality is the morality of an alley cat, even though in church you're Mr. Goody Two-Shoes. So we know how to play this dualistic game because you've never let the Scriptures guide you. You've never really connected with God. You can play at God. You can play for your parents, but you can't fill yourself or your friends, right? And so the price of being cool is having a pseudo-Christian experience. And that happens for adults too, where we're more concerned with appearance versus reality. But Scripture is an entire way of life. God calls us to think His thoughts after Him, to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. 
C.S. Lewis said this so beautifully. I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun is risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun is, has risen, not because I see it, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. The scriptures woke him up. He began to see things that his academic education had not given him, and he was a brilliant man. He began to see things through the lens of theology, the lens of spirituality, by the work of the Spirit, and so have I. I'm not a smart person. I'm not a very great thinker, but I have read now because I've been a Christian, because God got a hold of my mind. And I continue to seek his wisdom as I grow. It teaches us the right way to be and do. But then we face the pluralistic challenge. You see, our minds seek unity, harmony, and peace. The desire for many people, because of trying to be uh, seeking harmony with their friends, is to turn to a form of relativism where every view is considered equal, or maybe there's some hidden component that might bind them together all as one. Atman is Brahman, Brahman is Atman. It all kind of eludes us somehow. But all is not one. And ladies and gentlemen, differences make a difference. If you don't know how to make distinctions, if you don't understand it between the difference between good, bad, and better, worse, worst, and ugly things, then you don't make any judgments or you make bad judgments. If you lose the ability to distinct, the only way you will learn to make distinctions is to think because all values, all beliefs, all ideas are not equal opportunity providers. They're not the same. Adolf Hitler had a vision of what a German society should look like. Paul Pot had a vision for Kampuchea. Chairman Mao had a vision for, for China. Joseph Stalin had a vision for the Soviet Union. Their ideas had consequences. The militant Islamists and the radical seculars do not handle diversity well. And young men, young women, ideas have consequences. Good ideas have good outcome. Bad ideas lead to bad outcomes. So as Christians, and believe me, there are bad ideas in the church too. That's why as Christians we have to do theology. It's why we have to think. Because sometimes bad theology corrupts hearts and corrupts church structures. In the book of Revelation, there are churches that have lost the light because they lost their relationship to God because they became independent systems separated from their Lord. It happens in a church and it can happen elsewhere. Ideas have consequences. Therefore, we have to think. Think about what? We're trying to find something to measure ideas. There must be something independent of the thing being measured. If Nazism is wrong, if I'm going to say that abortion is wrong, if I'm going to say anything is wrong, there must be some independent standard by which I can measure the thing being measured. But if all values are equal, there is no independent standard. All there is is taste and perspective. You young people will get this in a million movies today. You know, it's just all about taste. It's all about what's good. It's all about your feelings. It's all about your emotions. I do not want to undermine your emotions or your feelings. Those are important. But there's more to life than that. And your emotions should be your servant, not your master. If I do only what my emotions say, I will lead a disastrous life. You look at the, what happens in society and culture. Yes, emotions are important. They have to be harnessed. They have to be carefully looked after. But the heart has reasons that reason itself cannot know. And if we are fallen, sometimes we cannot trust the heart because the heart can be deceived. Jeremiah 17 tells us that. Jesus said in Mark chapter 7, out of the abundance of the heart comes the things. So if everyone says, follow your heart, that is absolutely contradictory to Scripture. Follow your heart and you might end up in a very dark place. If your heart is surrendered to the King and you are born again, you're a new creation, you still have to put your heart under discipline, under God's Word, under the church, and under wisdom. Because I wouldn't trust my heart. Trust me. <laughs> So Christians live in a, in a world that is what? It's crowded, contested, and challenging. And therefore, we cannot engage with people unless we think, without our minds engaged, and without having reasons 
for the hope that you have. Why do you believe? I get this all the time. You'll get into a casual conversation. Sometimes I try to avoid having a conversation. I just want to read my book, but invariably people who live on planes like me and others, someone's going to sit beside you and they'll say, so what is it you do for a living? <laughs> well, let me try and find how I can position this. So I tell them, you know, I, I talk about ideas. We go to universities. We talk to people about the meaning of life. Really? So what is the meaning of life? There is no meaning. Oh, you've just said the meaning of life is there's no meaning. How do you justify that? And then off we go. And it can be fun, and it can be challenging, and it can be extremely difficult. So I got to learn. I had to learn to think. I didn't have the tools. I remember once I was out at this evangelistic thing, and, you know, I was traveling around Europe, and, and uh, I saw this, this group. They were told to me they were the best evangelists in the world, you know, public events, so go and watch them. So this is in Paris, and Paris is very secular, and this group there from the U.S., and that, you know, they've got sketchboards, and they're doing all, and it was good stuff, I have to say. But you know, they're, they're, they're sharing, they're painting pictures, and the crowd's engaged, and, you know, the guy kept every five minutes, Jesus is the answer, and, you know, Jesus is the answer, and I'm walking around there, and this guy says, what's the question? <laughs> Classic for Christians, going out asserting Jesus is the answer, and never taking the time to find out what the question is, or if the people even have a question. Jesus will never be an answer. Unless people not only have a, it's not a question up here, it's a question in here. And so the part of really witnessing to people and working with them is to get down to the core where they finally have a question. Then you can talk about Jesus the answer. I know, Chris, I've watched it. I've seen people doing, saying what they say is evangelism. It isn't evangelism, it's spiritual mugging. They just slap people around with Bible verses and hit them over the head. And every time they try to say, well, Jesus said this. Oh, well, the Bible, you just have to believe. And, and they think, and oh, well, I really witnessed to that guy. You didn't witness to anybody. You just slapped him around with the Bible. Because it's unpersuasive. And it shows by the caricatures on Comedy Central. And it shows by the way that people, are, are Christians, are looked at as foolish. And we are foolish because we accept that. And we, we keep perpetuating this as a methodology because it's cool and it's prophetic. And it's, it's you know, well, I was out there and I told him because I'm really, I'm a Jesus guy. You know, I just go and I just laid it on the line with the Holy Spirit on top of me. Well, I really whammed him for Jesus. And the guy walks away thinking, what a wacko. Now, I'm not saying that, that there's never a place for some of that, and I'm not saying that God doesn't use fools for Christ. I know He does, and God uses the odd ducks because God's bigger than us, thank goodness. But there are intelligent ways to do this as well. So let's learn some of better ways to be more winsome, to be more thinking, to be more engaged. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15, Paul writes to him, he says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, handling accurately the word of truth. So I need to get the God, the scriptures in my mind because I need to know my story. If I don't know the Bible, if I don't know what it says, if I don't know the, the narrative of scripture, what am I witnessing for? If I'm going to be up against Marxists and existentialists and, and people from Islam and people from Hindus, Hinduism, they're not my, these are people made in the image of God. They're wonderful human beings, but they're from other cultures, other worldviews. If I don't know my text, how can I share with them in theirs? I have no answers. And some of us never read our Bibles. Your Bible sits on a shelf. It's just ignored. Responding to the secularization of his times, G.K. Chesterton wrote this in the Daily News in June the 22nd, 1907. If people must not be taught religion, because that was what was beginning to happen in Britain at the time, they might be taught reason, philosophy. If the state must not teach them to pray, it might teach them to think. And when I say that children should be taught to think, I do not mean, like many moderns, that they should be taught to doubt. For the two processes are not the same, but are in many ways the opposite. To doubt is only to destroy. To think is to, to create. You see, what is passing in our culture for education today is nihilism. Nihilism is negation. Deconstruction is everywhere. It's in the church. It's on the internet. It's in the blogosphere. Everybody can deconstruct. There are very few people who can build. You know, if I was to come into Hong Kong with a number of bulldozers, it's easy to come down and knock down some of these buildings. It takes a highly trained mind and engineers and skilled people to put these beautiful buildings up. These magnificent bridges were because men and women went to universities, studied engineering, studied physics, studied law, studied materials, studied all kinds of things. This is an amazing city because of great minds invested in the business world, in the education world, in the engineering world, and other kinds of things. So deconstruction can doubt everything. But it doesn't doubt itself. It's interesting, isn't it? Doubt your doubts, and maybe you'll starve your faith. Or doubt your faith, you'll starve your faith to death. But doubt your doubts, you might feed your faith. 
Maybe you need to give the priority to doubting your doubts instead of doubting your faith. Have you ever tried that for a change? See what happens. So where does this go? Well, truth begins our transformation. Romans chapter 10 and verse 14, 14 it says, How shall they hear without, the gospel, without hearing the preacher or the hear, hearing the gospel preached? In Hosea chapter 4, 6, it talks about a day where there'll be a famine for the word of the Lord. I am tired of hearing in churches all kinds of emotional exhortations and power, but very little of God's word. There are evangelicals today who know nothing of the Scriptures. You could ask them about friends, or you could ask them about uh, the Big Bang Theory. You could talk about Sheldon and Wallowitz and, you know, whatever. You can ask them about Divergent or the, the Dark Knight trilogy. You can ask them about the Hobbits, and you can follow the, you know. But then you ask them, who's Hosea? Tell me about the book of Hosea. Talk to me about Jude in the New Testament. Tell me the narrative of Scripture. They've been in church all their life, and they couldn't answer it to save themselves. Media savvy, biblically ignorant. So what kind of gospel do we have if we do not take the primary narrative as our shaping structure? Be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We're being conformed into the image of Hollywood marketing and media that has bought into the church, has transformed our system, so the pastor is personality or the Christian is success, the church is a consumer model where we just come in and we consume a lot of songs, a lot of music, get all emotional and stirred up, and we go out, we come in just as we are, and we go out just as we were. Because there's not a commitment to be like Jesus. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. But as a result of, of not thinking, Dallas Willard put it this way, without correct information, our ability to think has nothing to work with. Indeed, without the requisite information, we may be afraid of thinking at all or may simply be capable of thinking straight. As a result, someone asks us a question, we panic, we avoid witnessing, we hide from public issues. Someone comes up and says, I well, hope they don't ever ask me a question. Are you a Christian? Mm, I won't start, start off. No. Well, do you believe this? Can I ask you? No, no, no. You have to ask my pastor. Get on the internet. Go to the blog or we'll send them off. Anybody but me because we're, we have no skills, no ability, no courage, no strength. Why not? Is that what you want? Brothers and sisters, rise up. Take the challenge. Yes, you have to do some reading and thinking. Yes, you have to learn some things. But it's worth it. Because it's a, the adventure itself lets you know uh, stuff and opens your eyes and your mind and it gives you abilities. Education is a wonderful thing. It's not the only thing, but it's a wonderful thing. So what is thinking? It's the activity of searching out what is true in the light of given facts or assumptions. It extends the information we have in our mind, enables us to see the large picture, to see it clearly and wholly. And thinking undermines false or misleading ideas and images as well. It reveals their falseness. Thinking is a powerful gift of God to be used in the service of truth. So you want to become a closet thinker. You want to become a serious thinker. Your friends need to be wondering that, oh boy, he's thinking a lot these days. He goes off into cupboards and he thinks. He was sitting in alone. What was he doing? He was thinking. I caught him thinking in his car. Wow. He was in an elevator. And what was he doing? He was thinking. Oh, my goodness. He's a secret thinker? Oh, no. In the church, sometimes you have to be a secret thinker because there's no room or space to do anything. It's just noise and things. And again, please hear me. If I'm not meaning to caricature, but we are living in an age of social saturation where noise and impression and voices are around us 24-7. You wake up in the morning and you want to scream. Your iPad's already got a million messages on it. Your Instagram's been bar you know, going all night long if you weren't answering it during the night while you were trying to sleep anyway. You know, and on and on you go. There is no space. Fast from technology. Switch it off. Sw you know, pull the plug for a while. And read the Word of God and pray and listen and think. Lord, what does that mean? There are passages of Scripture I wrestle with, so wrestle with them. Don't just say they're hard. Think them through. To what end? You see, the Proverbs tells us how we think shapes what we become. As a man and a woman thinks in their heart, so are they. So if you think badly and poorly, then that's what you're going to be like. You know, I'm tired of all this language of self-esteem. I understand it. You know, most of us are just insecure and broken. I'm broken. I don't want to think about self-esteem. And the more I think about myself, I just get miserable. I mean, I look in the mirror. I don't like what I see. I don't, and I can come up with, if people criticize my life, trust me, I can come up with a million reasons on top of their reasons to criticize my life. I don't need any help on that one. Do you? But when I look at my eyes through the lens of my Savior, nothing in my hands I bring. 
I don't need to earn His approval. I don't need to work to please Him, that I receive His grace, that He loves me. He has made me as weird as I am, <laughs> and my friends as weird as they are. And listen, I have all kinds of weird Christian friends, really. I have people who are intellectually off the charts, and I have some people who can barely spell their name. They both love Jesus, and I love them. And some of them do strange things for God, and so I can't figure it all out all the time. But I like the way that God takes them as they are and uses them for all His glory. And thinking is a part of all of their life. Listen to this. To have our thinking as a Christian aims to have our minds properly formed, which is to have the great God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, a constant presence in our mind, crowding out every false idea through reading, through Scripture, through discussions. But that means then that we need to understand our context. We're living in a world that's contested. Listen to Ephesians chapter 6. Many of you know this verse of Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. Here it tells us, we, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. You live in a world in which there is an evil intelligence. Boy, it's amazing how many people forget this. They love the Lord of the Rings, right? Many of you are Tolkien fans. Come on. Fess up now. Dark Knight fans? Anybody? Even Big Bang Theory? Oh, come on. Some of you. All right. Well, there we go. In the, the Tolkien trilogy, the whole idea of, of the two towers and Sauron and this evil power and the all-seeing eye and, you know, there's orcs and there's, there's ring wraiths and there's all these dark forces. Ooh, that's a dark, sinister kind of universe. But you know that it's an malevolent, intelligent force. Why? Because Tolkien as a writer was using his Catholic worldview to frame the story. It's very different from The Matrix, by the way. Is a trilogy, and that's why the Matrix didn't work as well. A bunch of batteries being harvested from an alien for whatever. Um, but we are dealing against a power that works against us. So we know that struggle is going to be a part of this. In Romans 7, we see the struggle against the flesh. In Galatians, we have a struggle. In Luke chapter 9, it said, Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. In other words, to be a Christian, to be a Christian thinker, to be a Christian means to be denying yourself. But if you are being taught by the culture, by your friends, by your peer review, by the culture of cool, to indulge yourself... Then all you do, well, you no, know, too much time, I can't read my Bible. No, too much time to go to the Christian group. No, too much time to read. I'm just going to watch the TV. I want to watch ESPN. I want to watch Better Homes and Garden. I want to buy stuff. I want to go to the mall. I want, I want, I need, I need, I need. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. We're just like little hungry babies. Feeding pure emotion. Discipline is the counter trend to choose against yourself. So what, what do we see that pushes against this? Well, the first is what I would call casual Christianity. No discipleship. Christianity, where laziness, comfort, or ease define us. You know, I just come to church just to see if I'll get a prophetic word from the Lord, dude, you know. And just, you know, if the Lord wants to speak to me, then I'll receive it, you know. But, uh, you know, I'm not going to do anything because that's work, man. That's legalism. I'm, I'm just a cool. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just waiting on Jesus. And I came and I waited, never said anything, so I'm just going back to my laziness, you know. Hey. Yeah, really. Because we don't apply ourselves diligently to the Word, to study, to thinking, to being changed, to be transformed. Or spiritualization. This is a big thing. So we separate between, you know, oh, well, there's prayer and the Spirit. And again, I'm all for that, as if prayer is against theology. However, did we come up against a church that doesn't want to do theology? People say, well, I'm not into philosophy because that's worldly. Really? The word philosophy comes from two words, doesn't it? Philo, Sophia. What does that mean? To love wisdom. The book of Proverbs said you're supposed to seek wisdom. That's loving wisdom. That's a Christian thing to do. So, brothers and sisters, you don't need to read Albert Camus and Sartre, although some of the, you need to read some of it, but you do need to learn to think as a Christian. Because it will help us to overcome. It's not faith versus reason. What we are looking for is a reasonable faith. So that I have reasons for my faith. I don't put faith and reason as enemies. They're partners. They work together. So I do trust God and I believe God. I don't think I have to reason everything out. Sometimes faith takes me where reason cannot go. But reason helps me to balance so that my faith is also tested. But what's one of the outcomes of this? Well, it helps you to strengthen your faith. Many Christians live with doubt. They might not tell people, but there's fears in their heart. 
James Bilby puts it this way, where the goal of external apologetics is to encourage a change of mind in the skeptic, the goal of internal apologetics is to reinforce faith, to remove intellectual barriers, to help clarify issues, and in doing so, dispel doubts. I went to a conference. I was about 10 years old in my faith, and I went to a conference in Germany. And for the first time, I think I went through what I would call like a second conversion. I was introduced to what was called the Christian world and life view. And it was a revolution. I began to see that Christianity spoke to economics. It spoke to law. It spoke to medicine. It spoke to the arts. I was given categories. And it just changed everything. I was still a believer before that. And I was a believer after. But I was a believer with a range of options that I didn't have for about the first 10 years of my Christian life. And so thinking became very, very important. And as we go out into the world to witness, it's important that we do this with credible ways because loving our neighbor is one of the commands of God. Love requires good communication, doesn't it? How can you love people if you don't understand their point of view? How can we love them if we don't know how to answer them? In Colossians chapter 4, 5, and 6, it says, Conduct yourself with wisdom towards outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. In Britain, every week, often in Baptist churches, they might do this in Hong Kong too. They bring the children forth for the children's church. Do you do this? You know, this kind of thing where the pastor does a little sermonette and the kids. So the kids get used to this. So the kids come, the pastor, it's the pastor's moment, and they come up. And, so the pastor's telling this story, and, and uh, the kids are all gathered around there, and the pastor starts telling this story about, he said, okay, children, what is white? It's got big ears, and it it goes bouncing across the floor. And little body, Johnny, yeah, pastor, pastor, pastor. Yes, Johnny, Johnny. He says, sounds a lot to me like it's a buddy rabbit. But I'll bet the answer is Jesus. Because the kid had learned in the church, no matter what the question, Jesus was the answer, right? No, that's not bad theologically. But it doesn't work very well on the streets. And so what we've got to say is, why is Jesus the answer? And how, help people to understand. The biggest question of the Gospels is found in Mark chapter 8, 27 through 28, where Jesus was walking down uh, the road with his disciples, and he asked two questions. He says, who do the people say that I am? And they give various responses. And then he says, who do you say that I am? So notice Jesus asked the disciples, and they have a pluralistic response. Some say this, some say that. There are all kinds of different opinions. Not any different in Hong Kong today. And then Jesus turns to the disciples and says, who do you say that I am? If I am to give a reason for the hope that I, is in me, I have to do that by thinking. And we need to do by learning from others. I'm going to run through some things here on the insight of one of the greatest apologists of the 20th century. C.S. Lewis was one of them. Another man was the name Francis Schaeffer. Schaeffer thought deeply about his theology, and he began to think about communication. He could never have given you these ideas unless he had thought. So I want you to run through how a theological vision translates into a mission strategy. And here's what Jerome Bars tells us about how to witness. So this is as he looked at the theology of Schaeffer, as he was engaging with people from non-Christian backgrounds, from uh, existentialist backgrounds, all kinds of broken philosophies. And this is what he said, viewing people. He said, first of all, all people, no matter what their beliefs or way of life, live in God's universe, for it is the only one there is. In other words, he started with a creational understanding that Simon was talking about. This is God's universe, and therefore we have an advantage to talking to people because the characteristics of a creation are in them. That gives us a witnessing advantage. Secondly, the unbeliever may indeed invent another world to inhabit, a world of false gods, idols, a world where there's an obstinate refusal to worship and serve the true God and the maker of all things. Such an invention is what all religions and alternative worldviews are, not truth but a kind of make-believe. John Calvin famously called the human heart, I love this, a fabricum idolatrum. You like that? That's about the only Latin I know. A fabric of mine. It means an idol factory. In other words, we rejecting God, we construct idols in our own image. We construct something, anything but Christ, as an option to worship. Thirdly, it says, his invention doesn't fit what's truly there. It doesn't really work. So the unbeliever lives between two worlds, worshiping and serving the gods that he or she has chosen, 
but living in actuality in the world that God has made. So there's a tension, there's brokenness. They worship these gods, but it, it doesn't quite line up with reality. So there's a misfit in reality. Fourthly, if the unbeliever were consistent to his or her make-believe world, then he or she would be driven to meaninglessness, immorality, and irrationality. Exactly what Simon was saying. That's why in so much of the atheist worldview today, it is immoral, irrational, and just basically man be trying to build the world in his own image. It's why we see so much violence, why we hear intellectual people talking about abortion, euthanasia. It is profoundly sinister because it's not accountable to any reason higher than itself. And when you hear about humanism and we say, which human are we talking about? Richard Dawkins? Joseph Stalin? Which human should we follow? Fifthly, the unbeliever has to live in deceit, benefiting from God's world and the benefic beneficence. I'm so, I just saw the movie Maleficence, which I thought was brilliant, but beneficence, beneficence of his general grace, but suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. Six, God constantly confronts the unbeliever with truth, for the Spirit is the world's prosecutor. So that's the great thing, that God found me in a Glasgow bar room. He found my friend Nabil Qureshi, raised in a devout Islamic home, and from that background. He found Ravi coming from India in his background. He comes to in his world, and it's the Spirit does that. He gives both people up to the consequences of false or fake ways of seeing the world they have chosen to serve, but he also pours out his good gifts on the unbeliever. Their gifts are a testimony that challenges the unbeliever to repent and see the one true God, and they render the unbeliever inexcusable. Now, this is, this is a sign of what? Thinking. These are thinking deeply about Scripture, about theology. That's how you get these ideas. Number seven, we are to focus on the tension, helping the unbeliever to see that is all that is good, true, and beautiful comes from God, and that God's world and gifts are the true home, while also exposing the inadequacy of the worldview and idols to which the unbeliever has given mind and heart. Christians are not against everything, are we? We love art and music and reason and rationality and good movies and good books and good things and fun and sports and paragliding off buildings buildings and the dark night and all this kind of, we love all these things. Well, not equally, but you know what I'm saying. We, we, we are balanced human beings, at least we try to be, because we have a theology that engages life. But we know also that all that glitters is not gold, or maybe I should say all that twitters is not gold. Eight, we are to remember that we are never consistent either in our thinking or in our lives. For we as believers are still living in two worlds, therefore understanding our, our own fallibility and inconsistency, we are to communicate the truth with humility, grace, and respect. So as a Christian, I know I'm flawed. I, don't, I mean, sometimes we're talking to guys who are much smarter than we are. It's not a question of who's the smartest in the room. It's a question of whether God's there or not. And I have to exercise humility when I'm talking to someone, not presuming I have all the answers. I know God. That doesn't mean to say I know the answer to every question. Some people try to psychologize their Christian faith away. C.S. Lewis was once said, he constantly was asked, well, you believe in God because it makes you happy. Was In other words, to find the motivation, we can do away with God. Psychologize the thing. But C.S. Lewis, being a British Anglican, answered this very well. He said, look, if I wanted to be happy, I always knew that a bottle of port could do that. I came to Christianity not to be happy, but because it's true. Why, why are you a Christian? What's your reason? So let me wind up with this, meaningful and thoughtful witness. Ravi often points out there are core questions that must be addressed when we're talking with people. What is truth, for instance? And what are the, what are the answers of our other worldviews to questions of origins, meaning, morality, and destiny. How do they answer those questions? How does the gospel answer those questions? Does it answer those questions? I think it does. And when we get into that, then we have to have some methodology. The first thing is to do what Os Guinness said. Comparison is the mother of clarity. So we have to be compared, but you can't compare if you don't know. If you've never read, if you've never thought, if you have no ideas, you have nothing to compare. But if you know other worldviews, when people say things, or you know the Scriptures, people put accusation, you now can defend the Scriptures because you know what the Scripture says, and that's not what it says. I was in the University of Pittsburgh recently, or in Carnegie Mellon. The, the gentleman was a very nice man. He was a, a professor of philosophy, but he was extremely anti-Christian and very hostile. And he kept throwing out all these caricatures about Christianity. The problem was the caricatures, I understood where he got them, but they were not essential to the Gospel. So when I said to him, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I, you know, why don't you ask me a question since I'm the one here representing Christianity and I'll tell you what I do believe. Don't tell me what I believe because I don't believe any of the things you're saying. But you have to think. Reason is an important thing, isn't it? 
you sitting here, and I know you, whatever you're feeling today, you know, maybe a little bit bored now, you know, oh, these two sessions, I'm ready to go home and sleep for a week or whatever. Thinking is a part of you, but even your reason itself is a signpost, young man, young woman. You sit there thinking, and even if you're off somewhere else in your emotions, or you're thinking about the guy behind you, or the girl across the room from you, or the dinner, or the sushi, or whatever it is you're thinking about, you're thinking. And that capacity tells you something about what you are. It itself has to be explained. Listen to this. We've quoted C.S. Lewis already, but listen to him on this subject. He said, all possible knowledge then depends on the validity of reasoning. If the feeling of certainty which we express by words like must be and therefore and since is a real perception of how things outside our own minds must be, well and good. But if this certainty is merely a feeling in our own minds and not a genuine insight into realities beyond them, it merely represents the way our minds happen to work. Then we can have no knowledge. Unless human reasoning is valid, no science can be true. Do you see this? Because this is a little bit sometimes we get into with some Indian philosophy and some ideas of, you know, is everything, are we living in a veil of illusion and there's no reality? And so are our thoughts real thoughts? Am I a butterfly dreaming I'm on the other part of the world? Or what am I? You know, we can go around and round with this. So we spend all our time disappearing into the dark hole within. But meanwhile, you go to the shop and buy your foods. You go to McDonald's and get a Big Mac. You go out and get on the internet. So you don't really believe this stuff because reality has a tremendous power to hit back, right? Christians are not afraid of reality because we know the one who made it. And thinking is an insight onto reality. Lewis said this, the value of understanding clearly what kind of a world we're in, a creation, as Simon said. It follows that no account of the universe can be true unless that account leaves it possible for our thinking to be a real insight, a theory which explained everything else in the whole universe, but which made it impossible to believe that our thinking was valid, would be utterly out of court. For that theory would itself have been reached by thinking. And if thinking is not valid, that theory would, of course, be itself demolished. It would have destroyed its own credentials. It would be an argument which proved that no argument was sound. A proof that there are no such things as proofs, which is nonsense. And how many times have you sat in a conversation with some university professor, some bright person with a Harvard, Yale, or some other degree, or Hong Kong University, and they start off, there is no such thing but truth. And that's supposed to be intelligent. Because all you need to ask the question is, are you saying... It is true that there's no such thing as truth. Think about it. They must be or they're saying nothing. And by saying it, they're denying the very thing that they're supposed to be asserting. There is such a thing as truth. And we find it by relationship to God, through reasoning, and through seeking. So time to think, time to choose. Young man, young woman, older man, older woman. Lewis said this. Good philosophy must exist, if for no other reason, because bad philosophy needs to be answered. Who's answering here in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, in China, in Indonesia, all across Asia? Who's answering in Europe today? You young ones, the ball is in your core. Don't believe, don't drink the Kool-Aid. Don't listen to the propaganda machine. Get your minds in gear. Wrestle with your Bibles. Go and seek out the truth. And most of all, be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Yes? God bless you. Thank you. All right. That was pretty challenging. Yeah. Well, I'm going to give you all about 15 minutes to go and think, all right? So uh, we're going to do that. Uh, come back at 12.15 for our next session. Take a nice deep breath, drink some water, and uh, come back ready for more. We're going to talk about worldviews here in Asia and how we should be thinking about those. Okay, so please take 15 minutes. Come back at 12.15. Thank you.